As I said, our main message today is a continuation or the continuation of our uh, study into the book of Matthew. We'll be covering chapter 6 today. Um, we finished up chapter 5, and in chapter 5 we saw the, or began to see the examples of this higher level of conduct or character that followers of Christ, so-called Christians, are called to have. And we examined some different aspects of that. And chapter 6 continues with examples of how the converted should be conducting themselves. If we turn over to Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, it says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You see, the righteousness of the kingdom, not man's righteousness, but God's righteousness, is still the main subject of Christ's message here. Uh, the illustrations of the passage we just read, they fall under the umbrella of what we would call morality as distinguished from religion. But it's important to note that Christ makes no distinction between the two. You see, your life and your religion and your morality and your character are, are all one and the same. They're not two different things. You know, everybody has their, their church persona and their private persona. Well, those two are not supposed to be different. Morality divorced from religion is like a flower that has no root. It may bloom for a bit, but in the end, it's just going to wither and die. Religion without morality, without the, the principles being espoused and expounded upon by Christ in these passages is really nothing at all. And actually, it's worse than nothing. It's a complete sham. It's a facade. It's a falsehood. And in the end, a lie. It's the outward appearance of righteousness. Let's look at the book of Samuel. 1 Samuel 16. If you'll turn there. 1 Samuel 16, verses 6 through 7. It says, When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely Yehovah's anointed is before him. But Yehovah said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For Yehovah sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but Yehovah looks on the heart. So here Samuel is, is trying to choose a suitable replacement for Saul uh, to be king over Judah. And uh, Samuel was looking at the, the outward appearance of the man. And he's corrected by saying that God looks at the inward man. True character of a, of a person, a man or a woman, is what Yah is concerned with. The outward appearance means nothing when it's all said and done. It doesn't matter what you appear to be. It's what you are. And it's evident, of course, that this, this 
word righteousness as used by Christ has a, a far wider scope than is given to it by those who take it merely as the equivalent of truth and honesty, right? That letter of the law that we talked about in chapter 5. As if a man could in any proper sense of the word be righteous, who was ungenerous to his neighbors or profane to God and not the master of himself or herself. So, you know, you're definitely not going to be considered righteous if you haven't even mastered these basic fundamentals of you, you shouldn't lie, you shouldn't murder, etc. But that's not what is being discussed here. We're still talking about this spiritual essence of the law. So again, we have a principle laid down. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. And it's the same great principle that we discussed before. The cautionary warning or the cautionary nature of it is different, but it's the same message, same principle. And if you look at Matthew 5.20, you can see what we're discussing. And remember, it's subsequent development in the verses that follow, right? So he says, I came not to destroy the law, but to magnify it or fulfill it. And then he went on to expound on how that happens. You know, what the, the added elements or the true essence, I should say, uh, were of the, of the law. And we find that it agrees with the warnings we're talking about now. And it insists on a righteousness of the heart as distinguished from a righteousness that is merely outward. And we must embrace that higher level of conduct required by the spirit of the law introduced by Christ if we are to achieve that crown spoken of by the Apostle Paul. And the difference really lies in this, that whereas in the cases already dealt with in chapter 5, external conformity with the law is good so far as it goes, but doesn't go nearly far enough. What did he say? He said, unless your righteousness shall exceed that of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, right? And by exceed, he means by reaching down to the deepest recesses of your heart and mind. And in these current examples that we're discussing now, external conformity is not good in itself, but really evil, inasmuch as it is a mere pretense of righteousness. Accordingly, the caution now is much stronger when he says, be you not as the hypocrites. It is not, however, the being seen which is condemned. Otherwise, the admonishment we have in Matthew 5, 16 would be at variance with what we're being told here when he said this. In Matthew 5, 16, he says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So our works have to be seen. So it's not the being seen that is being condemned. And that would, in fact, uh, amount to a total prohibition of public worship. As before... It's a matter of the heart, the intent. It's that hidden motive which is condemned. And brethren, our hidden motives are a constant 
facet of our spiritual maturity that we have to be constantly evaluating. When we are angered by something, when we are annoyed by something, when we think, when we have a problem with somebody, the very first thing we should do is question our own motives. Because nine times out of 10, our motives are not pure. And if we're gonna strive for this type of character, we had better be evaluating our own motives. Because quite frankly, other people's motives are not our concern. Now, if we have a brother and we see them doing something wrong, we are, we are our brother's keeper and we have a, a duty to him or her to go and discuss it with him. But we're here to work out our own salvation. And it's easy, as it says in the scripture, to you know, see, see the beam in our brother's eye or the moat, the little splinter in our brother's eye and not even notice the two by four in our own. So we should first question ourselves and our own motives before we start looking outwardly. So it's this, it's this seeking to be seen that is condemned. And this principle is applied in succession to charity, to prayer, and to fasting, right? Charity is no longer regarded at, as a distinctively religious duty, nor can it be put under the banner of morality according to the common idea attached to that word. It really sits on the borderland between morality and religion. And it really kind of, it comes under the head of what we would call philanthropy. And what is the origin of that spirit of philanthropy? Its foundation is in the principles and character of our Father in heaven. True philanthropy is the genuine concern for others' welfare and, and giving to, to better their situation and their welfare, to care for their welfare. It's like, it's like a giant freshwater lake, an alpine lake. So you can walk around the lake and admire and delight um, in its beauty for long distances even, without really understanding or making the connection to the principles that make it that way, the, the inputs that make it that way. But that connection is still there. And if you walk around it long enough, you're sure to find it. It could be a, a, a stream that runs into it. It could be a spring of water that keeps it filled up. And though they may flow underground, it really brings the precious supply of that clear spring or fresh water from the higher regions. And it, it could be even hidden. But that's, that's what philanthropy is like. You see that end result, but you don't necessarily see all of the inputs to it. And if those inlets or inputs to that alpine lake are cut off, then the lake would dry. It would become filled with moss and, and the water would become stagnant and it would eventually cease to exist. Charity, therefore, in its right place, or is in its right place within this umbrella of philanthropy, its source is in the higher regions of the righteousness of the kingdom. That's where charity comes from. It's a 
godly spiritual principle. And in, in the early days, those lakes hadn't yet been formed for the, those springs were only beginning to flow from the great fountainhead, which is Yehovah. But now we, we see more clearly and we are without excuse. And the general object that Christ has in view, moreover, leads him to treat the subject, not in relation to those who receive, but to those who give. See, this is not about the recipients of that philanthropy or that charity, but it's about the providers of it, the givers. There may be good that is done through the gifts of men who have no higher object in view than the sounding of their own trumpet. They want to be seen by their fellow man to be a philanthropist and to be lauded for their, their giving. But so far as they themselves are concerned, their giving has no value in the sight of God because everything depends on the motive. And this is why we have the admonition to do it in secret. Because it's, it's your motive. And that's what Christ was, has been talking about this entire time in regard to the law. Keeping the outward physical letter of the law is falling short of the requirement. What did he say? He said, I will write my laws on their heart meaning he is going to instill that in our very character so that the outward keeping of something is just a manifestation of what's going on in our brain. You can't walk around wanting to kill someone and just not kill them and think you're okay. The, idea, the fact that you're walking around feeling like you want to kill someone is problematic for your spiritual welfare. And there may indeed be circumstances that suggest or even require a certain measure of publicity for the sake of the object or cause to which gifts are devoted. So you may have a, a cause that you want to promote to help people. So that cause in itself may be advertised in the, in the public. But so far as the giver is concerned, the more absolute the secrecy, the better. Because then it's the real intent See, a lot of people want to be, they want people to think they are a good person. So they want people to know that they gave. But the fact that you're a good person should just emanate from your everyday life. And though it's possible to give in the most open and public way without at all indulging the petty motive of pretension, Yet, human nature is weak on, on that side. And that's why Christ puts this warning out there in the very strongest terms. He counsels us not only to avoid pursuing the attention of others, but to refrain from even thinking of what we've done. And, and that really seems to be the point of the, the, uh, those words very memorable words where he says, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You hear that phrase a lot. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Normally it's, it's uh, <laughs> in a negative connotation, but not here. And all of the trumpet blowing and, 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 Publicity may be a great success. 
But what Christ thinks of that success, and what God thinks of that success, is seen in the, the irony of the words, truly I say to you, they have their reward. So you may get applause for doing something from your fellow man, but the true measure of success is in what God thinks of what you've done. Because if all you're after is seeking recognition from your fellow man, then you have your reward. There it is, and you can, you can see just how insignificant and pitiful it is, for there is nothing a man is more ashamed of than to be caught in even the slightest attempt at parading himself, right? They want to do it. They want the, the, the applause from their fellow man and the notoriety, but they don't want to be seen as intentionally going after that or that being their primary motive because that's shameful. But if the praise of men is never thought of, it can't be said they have their reward. See, if you don't even think about that, then that's not going to be your reward. The ones that do these things with giving no thought to how others view them, their reward is still to come. And, and though it doesn't appear right away, it certainly will be worthy of our Father who sees in secret. Continuing on now in Matthew 6, 5 through 15. In Matthew 6, 5 through 15, it says this, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Here it is again. They have received their reward, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, and this is the Lord's Prayer. This is our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, or be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's an important point. We, we expect forgiveness, but are we always willing to give it? Do we hold grudges? Are we easily offended? These are things we should consider. So under this umbrella of prayer, there are two warnings that Christ gives. And the one may be dealt with in just a few words, not only because it exactly corresponds with the preceding case, but because among us there is scarcely any temptation uh, to do that which it is uh, against which it is directed, right? So we wouldn't really think of doing it. The danger now is all the other way. The temptation of true children of the kingdom is not to parade their devotion for show, but to conceal it for shame. Still, there are some directions in which even 
the, the caution against pretension or pretension in prayer is needed, for instance, by those who in public or social prayer assume affected tones, right? This, this sanct sanctimonious approach where they try in any way to give an impression of sincerity beyond what they really feel. They don't really feel sincere, but they want people to think they are sincere. And of that sanctimonious tone, we might say that it has its reward in the almost universal contempt that it provokes. Because when you hear that sanctimonious tone, you're just, it drips of insincerity. You just assume that it's insincere that, because it sounds so sanctimonious. And the other warning is directed not against pretense, but against superstition. And it'll be seen, however, that the two belong to the same category and therefore are most appropriately dealt with together. What is the sin of the formalist? It's that their heart is not in his worship. He goes through the formality, but his heart isn't in it. What is the foolishness of vain repetitions? It's the same, that his heart is not in his words. You see, it's the same on both sides. You have the, the one that sounds sincere and isn't, and you have the one that doesn't sound sincere and isn't. <laughs> because there's no discouragement against repetition if it's prompted by genuine sincerity. Christ again and again encouraged even persistent prayer and himself in the garden offered the same petition three times in close succession. So it's not repetition that is being frowned upon or warned against. It's vain repetition. It's empty of heart. It's empty of desire, of hope, sincerity. These are the things that are warned against, not much prayer, but much talking, much speaking. A lot of words, no meaning. The folly of supposing that the mere saying of prayers is of any use apart from the emotions of the heart in which true prayer essentially consists. If you don't pray in sincerity, it's useless. And don't think for a second that you can fool God. He looks on your heart. He knows exactly what's happening. So we carry on here. Second, I need to start a Zoom meeting for these guys. So we have to be careful that we don't get caught up in this kind of uh, activity. We have to be careful that we're doing things out of sincerity, like Christ or Paul said, keep these days in, in sincerity and truth. So to guide us properly in a matter that is of such importance, Christ not only cautions against what prayer ought to be, but shows what it, or what it ought not to be, he shows what it ought to be. And thus he hands up to us this 
pearl of great price, this purest crystal of devotion to be a possession of his people forever, never to lose its luster through millenniums of daily use, its beauty and preciousness becoming rather more and more manifest to each successive generation. This example prayer. And it's given especially as a model of form to show that instead of vain repetitions uh, that, that he condemned, there should be simplicity, directness, uh, brevity, in order, and above all, the plain, unadorned expression of the heart's desire. That's how prayer should be done. And this main object is accomplished perfectly. A whole volume on the form of prayer couldn't have done it better. He just had a few words here. And we're taught to rise high above all selfish considerations in our desires, seeking the things of God first. And when we come to our own wants, asking nothing more than our Father in heaven judges to be sufficient for the day, while all the true significance is laid on deliverance from the guilt and power of sin. That is the real focus. It's deliverance from temptation, from the power of sin. Then as to the spirit of prayer, note the dutiful reverence implied in the invocation, the familial spirit called for by the very first word of it. In the spirit of forgiveness, we are taught to cherish by the very terms in which we ask it for ourselves. In that way, we should forgive others. And all this and more is added to the lesson for the sake of which the model prayer has been given. So he gave this model prayer, which has endured throughout the millennia, as a, a, an example, yet another example of the fact that it has to be sincere and from the heart. Just like the keeping of the law of God, you can't have this outward expression of this sincerity. It has to be true sincerity. So the other application, the third application is to fasting. If we look now at Mark Sorry, Matthew 6, 16 through 18, he says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. And again, we have this, this aspect of being seen by others. He says, Truly I say to you, again, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Clean yourself up, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So this concept of, of being doing things in secret and being rewarded by our Father who sees those things we do in secret is repeated. And we also see over in Matthew 9, 14 through 17, more on the subject of fasting. It says, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said, <clears throat> Sorry. 
said, <coughs> excuse me. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skin burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Now here it is taken for granted that there will be such times, and the principle announced at the beginning of the chapter is applied to the exercise. Right? It's, it's, we know that these times are coming, but let it be done in secret before no other eye than his who sees in secret this fasting. And only in this way can Christians have the blessed, re blessed reward which comes to the heart that is truly humbled in the sight of God. Right? It's only those that do these things out of pure motives and in sincerity of heart that are going to receive that reward. And the, this principle plainly condemns the kind of fasting that the Pharisees would do, which is done only before men, as when in the name of religion, people will abstain from certain kinds of food and recreation on particular days or at appointed times without any corresponding humbling of the heart. You know, you've got the days of Lent. You've got these, these, these pilgrimages that they, they do in Hinduism and, and uh, the, the mystery religions in the East. And it's all a show so everybody knows what they're up to but is there really a corresponding humbling of the heart your fasting must be before God or it becomes just a theatrical demonstration as the hypocrites who play a part before men and when they go home put off the mask and resume their normal life He said, do not be as the hypocrites. Therefore, see that your fasting is before God. And then if the inward feeling naturally leads to restriction of the pleasures of the table or of society, or at, to any other temporary self-denial, then let it by all means be done. However, do so only as to attract just as little attention as possible. Right? We don't do these things to attract attention. Do so to attract as little attention as possible. And not only so, but if any traces of that secret fasting still remain when the atoning hour with God is over, we should be careful to remove those remaining vestiges of our fast, if you will, uh, before we return to our normal activity. Our penitence and prayer are for ourselves only and for God. Before men, our light should shine. That penitence and prayer belongs to us and God. And if you think about it, that light that shines is the outward manifestation of all of that penitence and prayer that we do in private and the good things that we do in private. So the three illustrations cover by suggestion the, the, the whole ground. For prayer may well be understood in that large scriptural sense in which praise is included and fasting is suggestive of all humiliation of the flesh and humbling of the spirit.
The first shows true religion in its outward charitable sense, and the second in its reverence toward our Father in heaven, while the third humbles itself. And all three are mutually helpful, right? So they all work together and are mutually helpful. Because the higher we rise toward God, toward Yah, in praise and prayer, the lower we will bend in reverent humility, and the further our hearts will go out to worldwide charity. It's kind of an interesting process. And all depends on truth in the inward part, the inward person, the inward man or inward woman on the secret life of the Spirit with God. And it's impressively stated throughout the whole passage. And we can observe almost a rhythmical repetition. Be you not as the hypocrites. It's repeated three times. Truly I say unto you, they have their reward. Again, repeated three times. Let your charity be in secret. Pray to your Father which is in secret, that you appear not to men to fast, but to your Father which is in secret. Again, three times it's repeated. Your Father which sees in secret himself shall reward you. And these are not vain repetitions, they're repetitions. They repeat it three times, but they're not vain. They drive home that critically important point with a threefold strength. Three is a number of completion. Now, from this point forward, the meaning of Christ's message is a little more obscure. And some have actually given up on the idea of finding any kind of orderly sequence in it, yet there seems to be no difficulty, really, when you look at it from the right perspective, when you approach it with the right point of view. The difficulty or perplexity seems to have arisen from supposing that at this point an entirely new subject begins. So a lot of people believe that he just carries on with a different subject. Whereas all that follows all the way up to Mark chapter 7 verse 12 arranges itself easily under the same general heading of the righteousness of the kingdom. Right? This is this is exceeding the righteousness of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, which is the righteousness of the kingdom. And you've got to remember, Matthew's message is addressed to the people in Judea that have been influenced by this Judaic religion of the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Now, according to this arrangement of the message, there is an introduction of 14 verses from Matthew 5, 3, 16, and a concluding passage of almost exactly the same length in Matthew 7, 13 through 27. And while the main discussion occupies nearly three chapters, the subject throughout being the righteousness of the kingdom, dealt with uh, first as morality, which we saw in Matthew 5, 17 through 48, the second as religion, as we saw in Matthew 6, 1 through 18, and finally as spirituality, which is covered in chapter 6, 19 through chapter 7, verse 12 beginning and ending with a general reference to the law and the prophets, Matthew 5.17 and Matthew 7.12. We'll jump forward just a bit and, and look at Matthew 7.12, which says, 
So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You see, it's an interesting point that everyone reads Christ's comments in Matthew 5, 20, and 17 through 20. And they look at that and they claim that the law is done away. However, all of this, the, the scriptures that we've studied in Matthew, from Matthew 5, 17 onward, are all about pointing out the spiritual aspects of the law and that if we don't keep the physical letter of the law and take a step above that and embrace the spiritual intent of the law, we are going to fall short. Because unless our righteousness exceeds that of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, we will in no way reach the kingdom of God. So the first of those passages has to do with righteousness as between man and man. And it's true that under that umbrella, um, under the umbrella of oaths, comes the duty of reverence, right, to God, to our Father in heaven. Obviously, when you make an oath and you're invoking the name of God in that oath, there is a, a huge aspect of reverence for God and his name, which narrowly seems to fall under th that subject. But remember that this point comes in by way of a very natural suggestion in dealing with falsehood and the regulation of conversation between men, people, which evidently belongs to righteousness as it pertains to uh, man and man, between man and man. Right? So that whole first passage talks about the relationship between man and man. That second section is with righteousness before God alone. And then the third, which we'll take a look at now, it deals with righteousness as between the children of the kingdom and the world, in the midst of which that kingdom is set up. So the kingdom, you know, the... the the children of the kingdom and the children of the world. And just as in the paragraphs that we've already looked at, we're shown that Christ came not to destroy, but to fulfill or magnify the code of ethics and rules of divine service in the law and the prophets. So in this, it will be made equally apparent that he came not to destroy, but to fulfill or magnify the principles involved in the, the political or legal code by which Israel was separated from the nations of the world to be Yah's peculiar people. The, the law and the prophets set Israel aside as a peculiar people. So the subject at hand, therefore, is the relationship of the children of the kingdom with the world itself. So from the Beatitudes, we have already learned that the blessedness of the children of the kingdom is to consist not in the abundance of the things they possess, but in qualities of spirit or soul, possessions in the realm of the unseen. Right? It's the, the, the fruits of the Spirit. Yet the children of the kingdom cannot do without the things in the world, right? We still require food and roof over our head and all of that. So what has the law of the kingdom to say regarding that aspect, the, this acquisition and use of these material things in the world? This subject is 
fairly broad in scope, it's large, and it can be difficult at times. <coughs> oh, sorry. But with, with great clarity and force and comprehensiveness and simple practical utility, It's, it's explained in a single paragraph, which is also characterized by a, a, an eloquent language. As before, the straight and narrow path is marked off by cautions on the right and on the left. On the one side, greed must be shunned, and on the other, the cares of the world. So you got greed on one side, you have the cares of the world on the other. The one is the real danger of seeking too much. The other, the supposed danger of having too little, of what we would call the good things of life. It is not, however, a question of quantity. As before, it's really a question of the heart. On the one hand, it's not the danger of having too much, but of seeking too much. On the other, it's not the danger of having too little, but of fearing that there will not be enough. And it's a mistake, therefore, to say that one, the one caution is for the rich and the other for the poor. It's all-encompassing. And it is true that the rich are often plagued more by greed than care, but they can often fall victim to care as well. They can be taken advantage of because they care. On the flip side, the poor are more inclined toward care, but may often find themselves plagued by desire for more than they have, which can lead to a condition of greed. They have little and they desire much more. So it seems better then to make no real distinct, distinguish, dis, sorry, distinction between the classes, but to look at each caution as needed by all. All right, so these warnings are, you know, one for the rich, one for the poor, but they're all encompassing and apply to everyone. So let's look at Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Here Christ tells us, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. It's important to notice the strong emphasis on the word treasure. And it's evident not only from the, the duplication of it, for the literal translation would be treasure not for yourselves, treasures upon the earth, right? So it is, it's duplicated there, it's redundant. Well, not redundant, but duplicated. But also from the reason against it assigned from Matthew 6, 21, which says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's clear then that there is no prohibition against having wealth or being wealthy but only of making it your treasure, your main priority. 
That's where the danger is. Just like there's no righteousness in being poor. Being poor does not equate in any way, shape, or form to righteousness. But against making it your treasure, the law of the kingdom is in the highest degree uncompromising. The language is exceedingly forcible and the reasons assembled are incredibly strong, right? So there are lots of reasons why this is so wicked and evil. With all faithfulness and with growing intensity, Christ shows that to disobey this law is foolish, insidious, and fatal. It's foolish for all earthly treasures are perishable, eaten by moth, consumed by rust, stolen by thieves, while the heavenly treasures of the spiritually minded are incorruptible and safe forevermore. Those are the true treasures. All of these things that we 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 possess, our homes, for instance. Look at all of the maintenance required on your home because the moth and the rust destroys. But that's where we put all of our effort instead of storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven. It's not only foolish, but it's really evil. And it's injurious to that which is most sensitive and most precious in the life, which is the heart. The heart, which is to the, the spirit, what the eye is to the body. The darkening of which means the darkening of the whole body. See, if your heart's not right, your spirit's not going to be right. Not the mere clouding of the vision, but the condition suggested by Christ's words when he said, full of darkness. That's where it ends up. And these words are followed up by the inevitable end of such a condition as above. Where he says, if therefore the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? So it's not only foolish and most evil, but fatal. For no man can serve two masters. So you see that to set the heart on the world means to give up the kingdom. And it's vain to try to satisfy two masters, two owners of the heart. One or the other have to be chosen. As he said, you cannot serve God in money. We have to set our things on the kingdom, our, our mind on the things of the kingdom. Set our sights on the kingdom. Continuing in Matthew 6, 25 through 34. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It's not, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. We sing the hymn talking about the birds of the air. He said, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? 
For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. It's not as if he doesn't know. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. See, you're not going to change anything that happens 10 minutes from now by worrying about it right now. The, the ESV is a little more clear in its translation. In the KJV, it says, take no thought. And to our ears, the, that phrase, take no thought, could seem to encourage a thoughtlessness and to really bless carelessness. The translators of the 17th century, however, had no such idea. It's the result of a change of meaning in a phrase, right? So words change over time and the meaning changes over time. And at the time of the translation, this term take thought meant to be anxious. As will appear from such a passage as that in the first book of Samuel. So if you look at Samuel, 1 Samuel 9, verse 5. It says, when they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. Now, in the KJV, Saul says, come and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. Evidently, in the sense of be anxious for us, right? This term, take thought for us. So it's apparent that uh, it wasn't against thoughtfulness and providence, but against anxious care that Christ gave that caution. When he said, you know, give no thought. So this change in meaning, amount, amounting in fact to the destruction and almost to the inversion of the sense, right? It's almost like an opposite understanding, is one of uh, many illustrations of the absolute need for revision from time to time in these translations. Not only to make them more correct, but even to keep them as correct as they were in the beginning, as the language changes. And although this evil seems to lie in the opposite direction from that of avarice and greed, it's really the same both in its root and in its fruit, for it's due to the estrangement of the heart from our Father in heaven and amounts, <coughs> as far as it prevails, to the enslavement to the world, right? If you set the things of the world as your primary goal, you become a slave to that. The covetous man is enslaved in one way and the anxious man is enslaved in another. And our language demonstrates every time we think or speak of this term freedom of, from care. So we don't need to wonder then what, that, that Christ should connect what he is about to say on this evil so closely with what he has said on the other, as he does by use of the word therefore. The, that word, therefore, connects them. He says, therefore, I say to you, be not anxious for your life. But though like the other, it is slavery. The sin of it is not nearly so great, and hence the difference in tone. Right? So this 
this uh, seeking after wealth is more egregious than being anxious about not having enough. So it's no longer really strong condemnation, but a gentle objection to being overly anxious. It's, a, it's not a dark, threatening thing like seeking after wealth. It's more of a tender pleading to not be anxious because we have a Father that loves us and cares about us. As before, reason after reason is given against yielding to the all-too-natural weakness of the human heart. We can't give in to these proclivities we have as carnal humans. And we're encouraged to remember what God has given us already, which is this life with such amazing powers and capability. He gave us our bodies with all of its marvelous intricacy and adaptation. And does anyone really think that our Father in Heaven is likely to withhold the basic needs to maintain the life that He so lovingly gave us? Or the clothes that we're going to need to put on our bodies? Bear in mind how the little birds of the air and the modest lilies of the field aren't forgotten. Right? Bring that to mind. How then can we think that our Father would forget us and all of the things that we need? We're of far more value, according to the Scripture, than they. And remember that the very fact that we know Him as our Father should be guarantee enough preventing us from an anxious care pardonable in the heathen, pardonable in those that don't know God and have no faith. But we know. We know our Father in heaven who knows what his children need. So we really have no excuse for being anxious other than our lack of faith. Remember also how vain and fruitless is our concern and our care, seeing that we cannot even in the smallest way lengthen the life for which we fret. We can't extend it one second while our times are wholly in the hand of him who gave it to begin with. And he daily satisfies our needs. Right? We have to put forth some effort, but we have food. We're not promised to have everything we want. We're promised to have everything we need. It's a bit of a distinction. And such is the basic outline of the thought in this passage. And to try to explain it further and make it much more complicated would take away from its simple and pure message. The best way to deal with this passage is first to study it carefully to see that it's meaning and point of, of all its parts is clearly apprehended, right? You have to study it and make sure you understand clearly all of the points. And then quietly, slowly read it over and let the true spiritual intent, the divine meaning, if you will, enter the heart and mind. Then, when the reading is finished and the lesson has been fully absorbed, then, with a, a tr trust, and we, we can have that full faith in the love and the promises of our Father. And then we might look back on these lessons and observe that not only are they 
is it a spiritual lesson that is being taught here? But we are encouraged and directed to observe nature and learn what it has to teach us. To look out at the beauty of, of the creation and the loving way that God has built in this caring for his creation. And as the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 23, he says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, so his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So his divine nature and his power can be seen in creation. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. The same darkening that Christ was talking about. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Right? So they gave up true worship for the worship of the creation. But Christ's words are almost like hidden pearls. You know, people gloss right over them and no special attention is given to them, really. But these glimpses of nature come so naturally from the creator of nature that no, no fanfare is really given. It's almost like it's too obvious. They appear for a brief debut, and then the conversation turns on to other things. And we re return back to that main lesson, which, now that the warnings have been given, can be put in its simplest and most positive form, which is simply this, brethren, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you from Matthew 6.33. Seek you, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, not ours, not our glory, but his. Already we've seen that this lesson has been implied in the Lord's Prayer, but it is well that it should be expressly laid down for us in a very clear fashion. This will ensure that the treasure is above, that the eye is clear and that the life is one. And all these things shall be added, so that tomorrow need not trouble you. We don't need to be concerned. You know, in this day and age, when, you know, we talk a lot about uh, the coming tribulation and how we feel that we're in the last days, and I find myself worried about what's going to happen to my family. How am I going to feed my family when I can no longer work because I refuse to accept the mark of the beast? When I was preparing this message, it was a great reminder that I should not be worrying about those things. As long as I keep my nose pointed in the right direction, and I'm striving to seek first the kingdom of God, then it really lies with him to fulfill his promise to ensure that I'm taken care of. And he will guide us where we need to go. You know, John said in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said, I have said these things to 
to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we take heart, brethren. Don't be anxious about what may come. And don't be double-minded. You Man cannot serve two masters. We can't waffle. We can't be so anxious and worried about what's going to happen tomorrow that we think in those terms. Well, I won't get the mark of the beast unless it becomes very inconvenient for me. That will not fly. You have to be single-minded. And if that means you have to lay down your life and get your head lopped off so that you can receive that crown that you so diligently fight for, then so be it. Obviously, not a pleasant thought. Obviously, not our first choice. But it is what it is. You cannot be, we cannot be double-minded. So have faith, brethren, in the promises of our Father in heaven and seek first his kingdom. Let the world worry about the things of the world. And remember, if our Father in heaven takes such great care of every little creature of his creation, how much more is he going to take care of you? That should bring us a lot of comfort and a lot of confidence. So brethren, we will stop there and uh, we will have our uh, closing hymn.